Hey, good morning. David Julin here at First Baptist Cramerton bringing you my sermon for today. The title of my sermon is The Dead Will Rise from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. As you can see, I am not in uh, the normal sanctuary at First Baptist Cramerton, but I hope you will allow me, uh, accommodate me as I bring about our text and our sermon for today. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we uh, as we as we are here in this quiet place, this place of resting, help us to hear your word. Help us to know your power. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. My sermon text today comes from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica there. And he says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Probably there's a lot of questions about this going on. You know, what, what happened to those who died? Did they miss out? According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who've fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The dead will rise. The dead will rise. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? With that statement, we're venturing into some new territory, aren't we? All of us have seen something like miracles, healings. People's lives changed around. We've seen revivals. We've seen many things, but nothing like the dead rising out of the grave. It's quiet here. You can hear some children in the background at the church and the daycare. But the reality of that, when we stop and think about it, how, how could that be? How could, how could we imagine that even being? How could these bodies, most of these are probably buried within the last 100, 150 years. How could they all be put back together? Is that just a, a myth? Is that just something that people wrote down? I know I had a conversation with my grandmother some years ago before her passing, and, and uh, she was talking about cremation, and she said, oh, I'm not going to be cremated. And I said, well, why? She said, well, then God won't be able to put me back together after I have... Um, for my resurrected body. And I said, well, Granny, I said, I don't, I don't think that's the case. You know, most, I said, most people, I would imagine who've ever been Christians have, their bodies have disappeared, at least tangibly from the earth, even their bones over 2,000 years. Um, we can think of instances where people died in traumatic events and soldiers and in fire. And so that would mean that the manner of your death would dictate whether or not you would have a resurrected body in the, the church. And the scripture nowhere implies that. So we have to, though, acknowledge that our understanding is incomplete. That's why I titled uh, this series that looking through a glass darkly, taking from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, the King James Version, looking through a glass darkly. So looking through a glass either that's dark that we can't see very well, or some translations have a mirror. And remember, the mirrors that they had back then were, were mostly metal, as far as we can tell. Polished bronze and polished copper. Um, the glass was not anywhere near as clear as what we have today. So it's a wonderful image for Paul when you are looking at something that you can kind of see but it, it, it's still dim. So when we see, and we see a mirror or a window, we see those 
the word is anachronistic, that um, it's belonging to a period other than being portrayed. So that may not be as clear to us, but it was perfectly clear, I think, to people in Paul's time, that we look forward, but we don't see but things but very dim. Uh, the knowledge is incomplete. That's the main thing he's trying to say. Our knowledge currently is incomplete. Still, it's clear he is not, I don't think, anywhere being like some image. The dead will rise. That uh, that means that our hearts will just be filled. No, I don't think that means it at all. I mean, if you look at the context, it means he is saying the dead will actually rise. How do we understand that? I think we have to move back from the future to the past. And we have to think about God and creation. We have to think about God and creation. And if God could create this world, if God could create this world, then we have to believe that God could recreate this world and recreate our bodies. You know, we look at this web telescope and look through the images and see a tiny speck in the sky where there's, as, as I, I recall, I think they said hundreds of galaxies. But it's like if you put a piece of sand on a finger and looked up there and then the rest of the universe. The vastness is, is so much, but that if we understand what the Bible says, God created that. And then we bring it back down from the vast far away to the right here. Popular Mechanics, an article uh, said that on the top of a pen, there are five trillion, on the top of a pen, there are five trillion hydrogen atoms. If God can design that, if we believe God designed that, that God created this, he can do the other, I believe. Now, Jesus' return is clearly taught in Scripture. Uh, Acts 1 through 11 talks about the fact that uh, Jesus ascends into heaven and uh, the angel says, uh, He will return the same way that he ascended. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, um, for uh, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So over and over, there's this idea of not this subjective return of Jesus in my heart or in my mind, not a dream, but an actual return of Jesus. So there is a return of Jesus, there is judgment, then there is new creation. I'm going to jump over a little bit of that. We're talking about judgment next week. But there will be a miraculous new creation, a recreation of the universe. Um, and actually, I think that we don't spend a lot of time on this. But I think that this, uh, this new creation answers a lot of questions that are some of the most difficult questions about this life and our faith. How could, if God's all good and all powerful, it seems that's what the Bible says, how could there be so much bad in this world? How could there be so many children who are hurt and marred and distorted and people who, whose lives are just filled with pain? Is it just God is doing his best and he, can't, and, he, and he can't do any better? That's as good as he can do? Some have said that. But I don't think that's the case. I think that what we have to do is think about this idea of the new heaven, the new creation, God is recreating the order where there will be no more sin and pain. Um, God is going to take care of that. And so when we see this, when people say, I don't think God could be all good or all powerful, we have to also be reminded of God's promise. Now, it's up to God to do it. If God can do it, then the other stuff makes sense. So what about the return of Jesus? I think there are two things to keep in mind. Scripture teaches that there, it's gonna, there's a part that's it's unexpected. It's unexpected. And also, it says that there will be signs. So are those contradictory to each other? I don't think so. But Jesus says, be ready. You don't know the hour in Matthew 24 when the Lord is coming. If he would, like a thief, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then we know of other scriptures that allude to that urgency, that suddenness. But also we find that there will be signs. There are scriptures about wars and rumors of wars and famines and persecutions. Those are a little bit harder, though, to, to pin down because we've always had those. Will there be an increase of them? Uh, one, I think, is a sign um, that 
but still itself is sort of uh, a vague, is the gospel will go into all the world uh, before Christ returns. But what does that mean? Does that mean that every person might just hear the word and that's it? Does it mean that there will be uh, a clear explanation? They will have the time to understand and respond? So uh, I think what's most important is these are sermons and, by, and lessons for people of faith to know. Uh, this, is, this is important, the biblical text. So be ready because it could happen anytime. We could all be ushered in front of God just in a moment's notice, even without Christ returning through our own death. But also we want you to know that when you see these signs, know that God's in control. He's got it taken care of. It's not like God is trying to reach around and, he, you know, it's like he's trying to herd cats and, whoa, 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 you know, here's something. I, I got to stop this one here and stop that one there. And I'm not sure if it's going to work. Uh, you know, God is ultimately in control. God is in control. So we have to be, that, that's the two things I think we can keep in mind. Now, I think what are some of the implications that we have here? I think we have to, like I said, be ready be ready, but also assurance. Also assurance. The implications, some of those are, one, that it's going to be God making all things right, not us. We may feel hopeless. Listen, I think it's sometimes if you don't feel hopeless about the pain and the problems in this world, you're not, you're not really looking at it. There's astounding problems and pain abuse in this world and if that doesn't sort of overwhelm you i'm not sure you're really thinking much about it but god is going to make all things right how do we make things right we can't but we can do what we can because nothing is impossible with god and we have that assurance that someday we're marching in co uh, we're marching along with him we're marching along with the one that will ultimately be victorious. And though we may not see it, uh, it's assured. That's what faith we have to have. Also, I think going right along with that, when we see the scope of who God is and his plan, what we're doing often may seem to be insignificant. It may seem to be something that is, you know, what am I doing? I'm down here. Um, you know, I can think of times when... We've had people at the church working with kids or teenagers, and it just seems like there's just nothing, nothing that they're getting across. But remember, everything we do, it's like the old Mother Teresa thing, we're not called to be successful, we're called to be faithful. And now that I've been in the ministry for so many years, uh, I've had the opportunity to see where many of those things did take root, and the seed and did bear fruit, though we would seem like there's nothing going on with that, that the kids are not paying attention, um, that, the, that, the, that we, we try to help people with addiction, we try to help people with hunger, all these things that go on, that, and then other people are hungry, or maybe they're, maybe they're addicted again. Listen, that's what we're supposed to do, is we're supposed to be faithful. N.T. Wright talks about the fact that... Um, he has an illustration with this for the Christian to be faithful is that imagine you're a craftsman in the Middle Ages and there's a cathedral being built and the designer comes to you and says, I want you to, to design this piece of wood. I, want, I mean, excuse me, this piece of granite. I want you to cut it out and I want it to have these dimensions. And you're sitting there, you're going, this doesn't make any sense to me about faith, but okay, it's a job. I won't keep doing it. And over time, maybe you do it for years and years and years. And all you do is cut that out. And then finally, they take it away. And then one day, though, the cathedral is finished. And you know where your piece is. You know where your piece is. And you go and you see how it fits in the whole thing. How it fits in that wonderful, beautiful cathedral. I think that's how we have to think about our work in this world. Our part. God's going to complete it. God's going to complete it. What we're called to do is to be faithful. Work hard with what you have. I think that's another implication. Uh, have courage. Be willing to step out. Remember the parable of the talents. Uh, the Lord leaves, the manager leaves, the person leaves, and he leaves three servants, one with five, one with two talents, and one with one. Talent was a, 
was a, uh, a measure of money. And he says to them, he says, uh, you know, I'm gonna leave this with you. When I return, let me see what you've returned back to me. The five, the one with five gets 10. And the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful and little, I'm going to present you with a lot. The one with two then has four. He has the exact same uh, commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. But the one, the one with the one talent, he buried his talent in the ground. He buried his talent in the ground and didn't bring anything back. And he is, he is rebuked by the master. You see, because God is ultimately in control, we have the courage to stretch ourselves to do things that we didn't think were possible. Um, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? I hope that we can all hear that. I think the other thing that I want to mention before we close is this life matters. This life matters. This is like is not just an exercise in futility. The end and the return of Christ and the judgment means that this life matters. What we do in this life is important. You may not have to do something that seems accomplished by the people around here, but what you're called to do is to be faithful. So Jesus' return is either going to be something that you welcome, or frankly, it's going to be something that you dread, that you fear. So these texts are also warnings. Be ready. Be ready, be prepared, be about our Father's business so we can hear, well done. For the Christian, the return of Jesus is something to encourage us. Remember these last words where we find from 1 Thessalonians 4. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We should be encouraged. Most often people talk about the return of Jesus and many of those things, and, and they talk about how fearful it is. It's an encouragement. It's that God's coming back. We should be encouraged, and he'll make all things right. So God will make all things right. You do your part. You don't have to do Billy Graham's part or Martin Luther's part. You need to do your part. Take courage. Take courage. Use the talents God has given you. And remember, these are wonderful promises, but they're also a warning. They're also a warning. So take that into account. Lord, help us all to hunger to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, God bless you, and I hope to see you soon. I might even be in a more lively place next week. Take care.